Thank you. That's really Thank you, Dr. Marin, for that um, sort of over-the-top introduction. And uh, thank you, in addition, for uh, loaning me Payam, your chief resident for two years, who is still helping me get my slides going, and in particular um, was helpful to me as I moved, as I transitioned from San Francisco to UC Davis, and he really was responsible for helping me move my lab, which was really an important thing because I was very seriously considering giving up my laboratory career, and everyone said you really can't do both when you're a department chair, and that may still be true, <laughs> uh, time will tell. But I think had he not been there to help me move, I probably um, would have made it easier to give it up. And I must say, I'm having more fun in the lab than I expected. And that may be because being a chair has some days where it's not as fun as I expected. So it's nice to be able to have that balance. So in fact, I think that for me, as a fetal surgeon, uh, global surgery has been a reason for balance as well, that there are times in, uh, you do this very focused work and you think, what is the point of this? Or how many people am I really going to help? And I, th I think global surgery has turned into an outlet that I didn't anticipate. And I now appreciate that so many more of our young people, our medical students, are really interested in global health. And I think if we as surgeons don't have an outlet for that, we will lose some of our best and brightest. It's a little bit intimidating to come to Sinai to talk about this because your program has really been a leader in this field for a long time. So I look forward to having some time for some questions. But it's really a very simple problem. I think as surgeons, we like to think of things in, in simple ways often. We are really glorified peace workers. We do things one at a time. Um, this is the way you knit hats or scarves. And there are a lot of people to take care of. What as a result, is that in many environments, there are people who just are not getting care. And it's daunting when one now starts to catalog the cost, if you will, of these surgical disorders. Pregnancy-related complications are enormous. And I now recommend that anyone who plans to do global surgical work should learn how to do a C-section. And we'll talk about that in a, a bit in the future. Also, trauma is really still the biggest cause of surgical morbidity and mortality worldwide. And interestingly enough, congenital anomalies um, are also a significant issue. We don't see it as readily in the United States because most children are cared for and taken care of if they have club feet. But if and any of you have traveled overseas and uh, been to some of the developing countries, you see lots of children who are crippled because of their of inability to have something as simple as a club foot taken care of. So this is one of my favorite slides, and it takes a minute to, to look at and really appreciate the incredible maldistribution of health care. And the, the center um, graphic, let me see if I get this right, is, um, represents the actual surface area, but if you compare the preventable deaths at the top to the government spending at the bottom, uh, the distribution of doctors, you can clearly see in a visual way how completely maldistributed our healthcare delivery is. So there are lots of approaches to trying to solve this problem, and historically they've focused a lot around a volunteer activity or charitable hospitals or religious-based hospitals in one or two locations, but there has not really been a, a coordinated attack on trying to solve this problem until recently, but that is starting to change. And there are several um, international and national organizations that care about that. I'll talk a little bit about the Disease Control Priority Projects, which is a way to try to catalog this. The World Health Organization Surgical Initiatives, also new. Um, the Burden of Surgical Disease Group, which was a sort of grassroots organization of residents who were interested. The Bellagio Essential Surgery Group was kind of a top-down of some department chairs and leaders in this field. So it's really quite interesting to see how many people are interested in this. 
And just for a minute, if you're not familiar with it, the Disease Control Priority Project is a joint enterprise between the Fogarty, the World Health Organization, and the World Bank to try to address and just catalog what is the burden of disease everywhere in the world. And until very recently, for the first two to three decades of this effort, it was largely focused on infectious disease. And as a result, the money tracked what we knew. So the money went to AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, really the, the three big infectious disease killers. And it wasn't until 2006 when there's even a chapter in this multi-volumed uh, text that, to talk about anything surgical. I mean, it just wasn't on the radar screen as an international or a health priority. This edition will have an entire volume on surgical disorders. And people are starting to realize that it's, it's as much a need to have your hernia taken care of, your appendicitis taken care of, your abscesses drained, or your uh, bones set, as it is to have uh, tuberculosis and malaria treated. But until you're part of the discussion, and I'll come back to this, you can't be part of the financial trail that ultimately uh, funds the solutions. So just because I'm a pediatric surgeon, I'm going to digress a minute to talk about congenital anomalies. I've had the privilege of writing this chapter for this book, and really until this, I also didn't appreciate uh, how significant the burden of congenital anomalies are in other countries, because again, it's, it's just invisible to us to a certain extent in this country. But in fact, 94% of the world's congenital anomalies occur in low and middle income countries. And that's because one, there's a higher birth rate. Two, there seems to be a higher incidence, likely due to variations in nutrition and other things that predispose to congenital anomalies. So this is actually a significant uh, issue. Challenges to care are similar to those that exist in the rural parts of our country here. But long distance to healthcare centers, Hypothermia, so the babies who are born, let's say, with a duodenal atresia. That's a completely fixable problem here. You go on to have a normal 60-year, 80-year lifespan. It's a simple surgical problem, but is often the cause of death if you are born in an environment that is hours away by foot from a uh, center and you can't, get, you can't keep the baby warm, you can't get them IV fluids, and they can't nurse. And then in addition, many of those diagnoses are delayed because people think it's some infectious disease problem that the baby is thin or not gaining weight when in fact they're just not able to uh, absorb nutrients. So what is the burden of disease for um, congenital anomalies? And the answer is it's enormous. And I'll come back to dallies in a bit, but just I bet everybody in this room, raise your hand if you know what a dally is. So not as many as I thought, despite your um, um, expertise here, but so disability adjusted life years, and this is sort of the, the metric that's used, and there's some controversy about whether it's the right metric, but to try to catalog what's the impact of having a disease on, uh, on a society and a person's life. And you can imagine for children, just because if you die young, that's 60 years that of life lost now, it has a significant impact. And potentially even more important, in many of these countries, this is the economic engine for our countries. Our young people are the ones that are going to do the work, pay the taxes, take care of us when we're old. If you lose an entire generation, that's a problem. So the, particularly again in, with kids, this sort of hidden mortality, the, the children who are born in village environments or rural environments where there isn't even a birth registry and a death registry makes it very hard to figure out what the denominator is. So this is a, definitely a challenge. But back to surgery in general, again, really until 2004, so not that long ago, there were no World Health Organization initiatives at all related to surgery. This was the first. They essentially developed a booklet that said in, that there ought to be access to surgical procedures in every country and in every environment, and that district hospitals ought to have the capacity to provide at least some surgical care. 
The Global Initiative for Emergency in Essential Surgery Care uh, followed shortly thereafter, and again, it was the first effort to try to coordinate what capacity existed in um, low-income countries, and then how to try to develop some of those capacities. And again, with some funding, not a lot, but at least a program officer at the level of the World Health Organization that did not exist before. Check lives, we've all, or uh, check lists we've all heard about. It's interesting that the check list really did develop out of an effort to try to improve surgical care in these environments although I think it's probably now uh, infiltrated all of our hospitals, but has become one of the most um, widely adapted initiatives. And then for the first time, it was discussed that surgical care ought to be considered part of primary health care. Um, again, I actually think we surgeons in this country would do well and, and may have missed the boat by not considering ourselves primary caregivers. Uh, all the additional support for primary care that's happened nationally. I think surgical care uh, should be, the, the basic care we provide really is primary care. We get lumped into thinking that we're really high tech or we're really expensive or the only thing we do are multivisceral transplants. But in fact, the basic surgical care that we provide most of the time really is part of primary care. And I think the more we can infiltrate ourselves into that conversation, the better we will be as a, a practice, and the better our patients will be. So maternity care, uh, emergency care, and surgery are now thought of as primary uh, health care initiative. So why should we in the United States care about global health? Why should we put any taxpayer money into this? We've got plenty of problems in this country, and that's absolutely true. But the IOM reported uh, with funding from all of these prestigious organizations and buy-in with all these organizations that in fact there were many um, national interests that supported um, an interest in global health. The, I had the privilege of working with Dr. DeBoss, my former chair at UCSF, in fact he was the one who hired me, um, and he has been an outstanding spokesperson for why the United States should pay attention to global health. And one of the things that came out was that they recommended that the White House create a commission on global health. This was um, early in the Obama administration with the idea of prioritizing um, and budgeting for the U.S. to contribute to global health programs and to actually put money into it so that for the United States to pay for global activities. And the reason of this, for this, is that not only is it the fact that infectious diseases now completely cross boundaries. I mean, there is no such thing as diseases that just exist in one country. And obviously SARS and all the um, avian flu and many, there are many infectious disease examples that uh, our international travel makes that true. But also, it's an excellent way to uh, go into conflict-ridden areas in a relatively um, neutral a posture. It's, it's a great way to develop public relations um, that's perhaps better than some of our other international efforts. So where does surgery come to play in this? And why should a medical student who's interested in global health think about a career in surgery? And I will say that the thinking about how to sort of address this problem from a surgical point of view really has changed, which isn't to uh, diminish the important work that has been done by mission hospitals and mission trips and groups initially like Operation Smile um, or Interplast, some of the early organizations that spent time overseas. But even those organizations are starting to appreciate the, that their lasting impact is really not there, that it's, the important thing to do is to help develop the capacity, train practitioners in the environment, and train people who can take care of complications, as we heard about this morning. So in San Francisco, as more and more students became interested in this and were interested in hearing a little bit about what I was doing, for many years it was sort of under the radar screen. In fact, I can remember when I first had the opportunity to spend some time overseas, it was between medical school and my residency, and I was very clearly advised not to do that overseas stuff. That that was for the family medicine types and the pediatricians, and that if you wanted to be 
a serious doctor like a surgeon, you should not do that, that that would adversely affect your career. Now, fortunately, I had a very um, wise vascular surgeon who said, are you crazy? This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. They're gonna pay for you to spend a year in Singapore and you should go. We'll f worry about getting you into surgery later. And eventually he did. But still for years, most people in the surgical world who were involved in this kind of work did it either on their vacations, and it was, it was never on your CV, it was just part of something that you did on the side. Um, and when a fr my first resident came to me and said, instead of doing the traditional lab year at UCSF, they wanted to go overseas, I said, well, let's do this. If we can get you a Fulbright scholarship, there's no way the chair can say no, because that makes the chair look good. This was before I knew better about the strategies to influence your chairman. <laughs> um, but it worked. So he got a Fulbright scholarship. The chair said, that sounds good, and I don't have to pay for it. So, you know, go off and do good things. So in fact, our first two fellows in global surgery at UCSF were uh, Fulbright scholars at the London School of Tropical Medicine for that reason. And then finally, I decided if I wanted to build this program anymore, I would just have to go be a chair myself so I didn't have to ask permission anymore. But we've developed a program with uh, sort of different tiers of people with interest. So I think there are those residents who really want to have, who intend to have a long-term career. Their academic work is going to be in global health. And then there are others for whom it really is a shorter-term experience. But I think those short-term experiences still have value because I think they uh, bring home often the reason why we do what we do. They make us appreciate um, the tremendous resources we have here and maybe complain a little less about the little frustrations. And I also think it helps remind one of the universality of suffering, that really all people are quite uh, similar in terms of wanting what's best for their children, their families, um, and it's, it's important to remember that, I think. So I do think there is an alternative. There is a different pathway. The training that you need to be a surgeon scientist, you need to learn how to do gels, you need to know what flow cytometry is. If you want to be an, a player or a leader in the emerging global surgical world, you need to acquire a different set of skills, and that's epidemiology, biostatistics, health policy, and those, again, are the tools for which you, um, which you need. Now, we're just starting to see what's happening, what's the outcome of these residents who are getting this kind of training. Do they, in fact, end up in a lower middle income country? Do they provide care elsewhere? What we're finding is that perhaps some of these people are ending up uh, serving some of our more disadvantaged populations in this country as well. And again, just some quotes of students who are interested and when you ask them why they think they want to do global health. So I'll just give you an example of one of the collaborations that we formed. I know you all have had a relationship with Haiti and the, the Dominican Republic I learned last night. We started our formal rotation uh, in 2003. Really, it was a resident-driven activity. We started to send faculty. And what we discovered was that there were challenges. The logistics are a challenge. The um, money is a problem. We also realized once we formalized it, we actually had to be concerned about resident safety and student safety. When they were doing it on their own, it was kind of their problem. But when we started to send them, we had to be more concerned. Again, just sort of an indication of where our faculty, our residents who were interested in this have gone. We now, I don't think we've sent anybody, either there or Davis, to the London School, but more people have gotten their MPHs either locally. We've sent some folks to South Africa. Most of them are getting MPHs, by the time they put those two years into getting that kind of training, you might as well get an MPH, and then you are also a little bit more legitimate, or you have equal footing with the other colleagues who are doing this kind of work. Because there is some resentment among the public health folks against surgeons. Again, they think of us as peace workers, not dealing with the problem on a broad scale, but just doing little things one at a time, and that we're just another cog in that wheel. And I think it's important to be able to say in a legitimate way that we, we do think about the problem um, in a more distributed fashion. And the one thing, I, I put this slide up just to demonstrate that you can do real academic work. You can ask specific questions, publish papers, just like you do 
in basic science or clinical science. And I think that's the important message for department chairs, that, and that this is not just you know, an overseas vacation, but this is asking questions, learning, the, the, acquiring the skills to do so, and then trying to come up with solutions. So just in a, a survey of program directors from a few years ago, uh, we got a pretty good response rate for program directors. And it was interesting that about a third did have some kind of global health activity. And of the two thirds that didn't, the majority of them were actually interested in developing programs. And that has only continued. And there have been similar studies uh, since then. Again, the problems are the same everywhere. The uh, time constraints, it's getting harder to have residents take time away. And also funding continues to be a problem. The RRC restrictions, interestingly, as, as your program director can tell you, have been lifted. And this was a, uh, the result of, again, grassroots efforts by residents and programs directors to say, we want credit for the work we do over there, and how do we do it? The way we do it is we ne you need to have a, an official faculty member on site, but that's happening more often. So just a quick example of a couple of the studies that have been done by residents. This is all work done by residents. Um, the first was just cataloging the workforce crisis, which I sort of pointed out earlier. But again, if you look at the um, healthcare workforce worldwide, there are about 45 to 60 million folks. The global deficit is probably two and a half million, and that, that the shortfall in matching the need and the healthcare workers falls largely uh, in our developing countries. So just to put this in um, numeric perspective, North and South America has 14% of the population, but almost 40% of the global workforce and 50% of the expenditures, whereas Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the focus of this particular resident study, has 11% of the population, so almost the same amount of population, but less, less than 1% of the expenditures, 3% of the total workforce. So a huge maldistribution, just another way of um, illustrating that. So why is that the case? Well, it's interesting, the things that he found. Well, first of all, one is um, brain drain. When people in some of these uh, countries get trained, and that's true, the same is true in our rural environments here, people want to stay where they can practice the skills that they've learned. They want to stay in our cities where you've got access to the fanciest equipment. They don't and you've got more people to share call with, they don't necessarily want to go back to Wyoming or back to their original country where they might be the only person um, on call or, or not have the facilities that they're accustomed to. The um, lack of infrastructure and the ability to maintain some of this is also uh, very readily apparent if you visit. Often, you'll go to a site and there'll be a beautiful ventilator or lots of equipment that says this was a gift from the you know, Japanese uh, mission in 1973. And all this equipment doesn't work because you need the techs. You know, we all take for granted, but you can call the tech to come fix something when you can't get the laparoscope to work or it's the bovie's not plugged in right. So if you don't have people with that skill set to maintain the equipment, it doesn't do any good if it's donated. And then AIDS, it's quite interesting. Still in many environments, and I remember this from San Francisco in the uh, early, the late 80s, early 90s, you know, people are afraid to become surgeons. People are afraid to uh, provide basic care at the side of the road because of a lack of understanding about how AIDS is transmitted, a lack of availability of gloves, things like that. People think, I don't want to go into that field, which is exactly what was happening in San Francisco and New York 30 years ago. So let's just talk a minute again about DALIs, you know, the importance of quantifying these surgical diseases because, again, if you can't catalog it, you can't help take care of it. So the disability adjusted life here is the years of life lost plus or lived years lived with a disability. So again, this is why the children, just by definition, because of the potential impact, um, have a higher um, DALI associated with almost all of their disorders. We would talk about diseases in this country in the same way if it weren't so politically incorrect. You know, nobody wants to talk about what is the value of somebody's life in this country, but we are probably going to need to do that when we need to start 
um, thinking about how we distributed our limited resources. Um, and those will be tough questions. So having metrics to think about how to do that in a reasonable way. And not necessarily what, but what does society want to pay for? Uh, and these will be the kinds of things we need to know. So I think there's a role for leaders who acquire these skills, not only to apply them globally, well, globally meaning internationally, but globally meaning here as well. Now, probably the most quoted number in this field now is this 11%, that surgical conditions somehow can contribute to 11% of the world's dallies. I have to tell you, this is almost a totally made up number. Dr. DeBoss and a few other people sat around in a room, they looked at whatever was available at the time, and they said, we think it's 11%. <laughs> Again, now it's probably the most quoted number in the, in the field. Um, what's interesting is that six conditions result in 81% of that 11% or whatever the real number is. And that is actually, this is a better, I think a more correct indication. So injuries, again, so trauma is a good field to go into if this is a field that you think you might want to do in the future. Malignancies, 19%, congenital anomalies, obstetric complications, cataracts and glaucoma, and the ophthalmologists for a long time through Operation Orbis and a few other things have done a great job um, because they have a relatively quick fix for many things, for cataracts. That's a relatively simple operation with few complications and you can take someone from being completely dependent and blind to being able to, again, contribute to society. So, um, again, uh, what I thought was interesting about this part of what uh, they found was that, I guess if you want to be a busy surgeon, the best place to go is Hungary. It has the highest um, incidence per patient of, of surgical expenditure. And again, the, this just highlights what I meant, alluded to earlier, that there's a significant um, morbidity and mortality associated with childbirth still in many of our countries that don't have access to uh, cesarean delivery. And obstructed labor, just the baby getting stuck, this is nothing fancy, um, results usually in the death of two people. And so I really recommend that anyone who plans to do this work spend some time with their obstetricians we all have the skills to do it. It doesn't take that much, and I figure whoever figured it out for Caesar had even less training than we all do. So you can learn how to do a C-section, and you are better at it than, than having no one at, at all. So you know, a day um, in labor and delivery would give you a skill that could be life-saving in these environments. So in general, again, it's interesting that most of the um, surgery that's done in sub-Saharan Africa is actually now being performed by non, what we would consider surgical trained folks, but people who just have one year after medical school get assigned to their district hospital and that's the service they do. If you then want to become a surgeon, you actually have to pay for that. Um, it's like graduate school training and there aren't very many. So. Um, one of the things I'll say is that training also follows money in Africa. And because the money is in AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, the best and the brightest students want to study AIDS, tuberculosis, and, Amer and uh, malaria because they can go to the fancy uh, Red Cross, PEPFAR-funded institutes and write grants, just like you know, stem cells are popular now because that's where the money is. Uh, so we see some of the same things. We need to get surgery funded so that we, again, can help address that uh, shortage. This is just another example of a study that was done by one of the residents. That One of the first observations was that there were no EMS system, no, no ambulances, no emergency system. We take for granted the fact that the patients just show up on our doorsteps often. So she did a study to ask the question, could you train lay first responders to provide um, emergency medical kinds of services. The, again, why, why deal with the emergency services? Well, again, the 90% of deaths are from road traffic injuries, and many of those deaths occur pre-hospital. So this is really the first place to attack the problem. So urban Kampala, where we did this study, is not so different from many of our other big cities um, all around the world. But the streets are different. 
even New York streets, although I got a little nervous walking to dinner last night, <laughs> um, make, you know, are, are civilized in comparison to uh, Kampala, where the cars, the pedestrians, the animals, the um, bicycles all share the same roads. So trauma care was a major unmet, unmet need. There was no formalized pre-hospital program, and we asked the question, could we train lay first responders to provide some care, and what would the outcome be? So the first phase of the study was to just identify who would be the right people. And this is where the context is important. In many countries, choosing the police would be a really bad choice. They are the most corrupt. They are not the people who you would want to be uh, part of this activity. In Uganda, the, the police are actually pretty highly thought of. They are um, important members of society, and they really wanted to have this extra training so that they could expand uh, what they did. So the Malago Hospital, which is the teaching hospital um, in um, Uganda, in Kampala, does anyone know what else it's famous for, another surgical disease it was discovered there? Burkitt's lymphoma was discovered, um, was Burkitt worked at the Malago Hospital in Uganda. Um, 1,200-bed hospital, kind of the old system. We certainly had it at San Francisco General when I was training. There was the medical side of the hospital and the surgical side of the hospital. There were no ER docs, uh, just a general surgeon trying to take care of what they found. So the patients arrived by private car, motorcycle, minibus, walked in. Fewer than 5% arrived by any kind of ambulance, and she did a survey of what the current status was. So I challenge you to find the patient. Uh, this was the, the usual ambulance. So the patient is lying supine under the bench uh, that the uh, police officers are sitting on. The other thing we discovered was that you can't even go. So if there's an accident out of town, 20 minutes out of town, you can't even go to the hospital by law at the time until the police have come to adjudicate the, the crime, the accident. Well, there goes your golden hour, right? You could easily bleed to death while the cops and somebody else in the family is fighting over who hit whom. Um, so that had to change, um, and that was a political solution. That had nothing to do with medicine. Again, different skill set. The immediate care, so even if the police do arrive and are adjudicating the problem, they have no first aid kits, they won't handle a patient without gloves, and so people come with open bleeding wounds that they've had for a long time. No airway protection, and the unconscious are supine and aspirating. So simple things can make a difference. So we asked the question, could you develop, and by we, this resident, could you develop an emergency system where there isn't one? Suda Jayaraman did this work. So they wanted to quantify whether what the lay uh, people who volunteered for the study knew, what could we teach them, and what would they retain at the one and three month uh, time frame. So we recruited 300 people, police officers, taxi drivers, local council officials, worked with the stakeholders to get buy-in, because otherwise it doesn't work, did the uh, baseline survey and then the uh, refresher evaluations. And this ended up spanning two residents' time in country in order to complete the follow-up study. So this was the course content, just briefly. In basic, not even ATLS kind of care, but sort of preliminary care, external compression for hemorrhage, immobilization of fractures, safe transport, and triage. This patient, you don't need to bring. This patient, you probably should. So coming up with a first aid kit was a lot of fun as well. You know, what were local materials, bleach, gloves, um, you know, gym bags, how to put it together. And our kit cost about $16. The commercial kits were, because you could buy a commercial kit. Everybody likes to have a certificate of completion. So we, we made certificates. You had a vehicle placard. We made an armband for folks as well. And it, what we could see, in fact, was that the cops actually did use the uh, first aid kit that we made. We saw them um, out and about. And patients did start coming to the hospital with evidence of having some kind of pretreatment, which was really a big advance. So in the initial pilot survey, um, it was interesting that some did have some level of first aid training, 
but most of them, it wasn't what they really needed to know. It's the kind of things that are in our textbooks that aren't, aren't really what you need to know if you're on site. So we um, helped sort of upgrade those skills. Access to equipment was a big problem. We also discovered that the willingness to pay, so even though we thought we were great with our kit being $16, when you actually ask people what they would pay for something like this, it was a lot less. So we learned we had to do something. So what were the results? Well, in fact, they did get uh, 307 people enrolled. The uh, post-training uh, knowledge was significantly improved over the pre-training knowledge. They improved in every level most importantly in the use of lateral decubitus position and the importance of transferring people with backboards and things like that. Like all studies, there were limitations, but it's interesting. This particular study has probably been presented all over the world more than almost any other study that um, any of the folks over the last 10 years have done. Um, and it's quite interesting. I'm just going to see if they... Uh, no, I don't have where, but uh, Suda has, was invited to um, India, Brazil, Egypt, Argentina, all over the world to uh, give a variation on that, that particular talk, how to teach lay first responders. Again, global disparities are as significant in, the, uh, in, in other countries as they are here, and again, road traffic accidents become the most significant. I'm just going to skip ahead to talk a little bit about um, another project, which is the FAST exam. I would say if there was one piece of technology that probably is the most valuable overseas and is a reminder that we surgeons probably ought to uh, improve our skills in this area is ultrasound. Because imagine, one ultrasound machine gets grabbed by every single practitioner. So the cardiologists want to use it to augment their uh, heart examinations. The OBs all want to use an ultrasound to figure out whether there's a patient who's breech or has obstructive labor, and the surgeons can use it as well in environments where they don't have um, CT scans or the other things we've got accustomed to for pyloric stenosis, for, ultra, for appendicitis, for trauma. And so getting good at being your own ultrasonographer, I think, is really key. And the folks there are excellent. I mean, they are better than we are because they're so, um, so dependent on this uh, technology. So I think some of you trauma folks may recognize Peggy Knutson there, who uh, went over and uh, she teaches a lot of the ultrasound courses at, for the American College of Surgeons. We enlisted her to go uh, teach um, folks there. And what we could do, because everybody's got internet capability now everywhere in the world, may not have regular phones, may not have running water, but almost everybody's got a cell phone. We were able to um, transmit some of these images and continue the training um, later on. So that was just an interesting, um, we had a couple of uh, courses. They, they donated the ultrasound machines for the courses and then they didn't, they expected us to bring them home. And I gotta tell you, somehow they magically didn't get home. I mean, it was just, it was a little bit of a miscommunication, but it doesn't do, it's, it's absolutely immoral to take a technology like that and train people and then take that tool away. Um, so we've learned better how to, how to negotiate these things ahead of time. Um, people had a lot of fun doing ultrasounds on one another as well, finding all kinds of things. So the, interestingly, what we also wanted to teach and share and learn from was how could we do studies together? Just because we think there's a problem, it may not be the same perspective on what um, local folks think is the problem. And that's true as we adopt technologies in, our new, in all of our hospitals. What works in this hospital may not work in San Francisco or Sacramento. So I'm going to just say that you don't have to go overseas to gain uh, unique cultural uh, experiences and competencies. And as our world becomes increasingly diverse, I think a, a hospital like Sinai knows this well, that the cultural context that people bring to their care influences their decision making a lot. Um, and it, where I am, this often is more our American Indian population, um, but many of our uh, immigrant populations also bring the, that cultural context to their care. And we, a lot can be learned by studying 
uh, you know, how best to deliver care in those environments here as well. At Davis, we have ended up um, focusing on South Africa, uh, looking for places that were relatively safe to send residents that were English speaking. And again, while there is a, a large and m modern environment in Cape Town, it's not very far away uh, to the area in New London where you see the um, village that um, the problems of delivering health care from a rural environment to a more uh, advanced environment uh, can be found. So East London is on the coast, um, not too far from Cape Town, and we have um, now developed an exchange program there. We actually had a student, uh, a resident working as a registrar for a whole year, so he'll be coming back this year. I haven't heard very much from him. While he's been there, every once in a while I've had to say, are you still alive? Are you still working? Uh, you know, call mom once in a while sort of thing. <laughs> um, but he'll be coming back this year. I think he's been very busy and will be interested to see how that um, goes. But again, the problems of uh, getting patients in from far away with limited ability to transport patients, utilizing the materials that are available, appreciating that kids all like to play video games, even if that video game looks like laparoscopy, that's fun for them. That's a budding surgeon in the making. And um, the patient environment uh, influences how people um, arrive at your hospital. The other thing that's interesting are the little bit different variations and new diseases. And this African degenerative lyomyopathy is a disease that um, is hereditable, but we don't know what it is. It's not Hirschsprung's disease. It's um, not midgut volvulus, and we're working now with our pathologists and some pathologists from Washington University to help get a better understanding of what some of these other kinds of diseases um, are. So I'll just summarize by saying that there are many paths to a career in global surgery for um, our residents and young people now. The tools that you need are a little bit different, but they are easily accessible. And you are no longer kind of a stranger in that environment. And in fact, I, I think the more of we surgical types who infiltrate the MPH world, uh, the better we'll be able to improve that understanding. And they'll be able to appreciate that, in fact, the kind of care we deliver although it seems high-tech and expensive in the beginning, may in fact be cost-effective. Because once you get the basic infrastructure in place, we often cure our diseases somewhat permanently, as opposed to having to deliver AIDS medication, where you're do, you can do it for 30 years, but then if you miss it for three weeks, you're back to square one. So, in fact, when you actually weigh the cost-effectiveness, um, you can make a strong argument that, uh, that surgical care, in fact, is cost-effective. That the, and the price of living with many of these complications or diagnosing them late, even gallbladder disease, appendicitis, um, creates a much bigger burden on society than the expense of developing at least basic surgical care. So I think the importance of um, surgeons being involved in this field can't be underestimated because we, I think, are uniquely qualified to be advocates for this kind of work that our colleagues in internal medicine and infectious disease really aren't because they, they don't know what it is that we do. So I think until we are in the game, we're not going to be able to influence the uh, conversation. So I just want to acknowledge all the people who have made this possible and really this work is very little mine. I really have been, I would say, the, the midwife for this activity in California. And the, uh, the young people who are interested in this are the ones that have really done the hard work. And I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to come here and I'd be delighted to hear a little bit about your program and uh, take a few minutes to just talk about what we can maybe do together. So thank you very much.